Hello, everyone, and welcome to our latest Critical Conversation event. My name's Hayatun Sulam, and I'm the Chief Executive at the Royal Academy of Engineering and the Queen Elizabeth Prize for Engineering Foundation. And it's my great pleasure to be hosting another of these online fireside chats that we run to explore topical issues that are important for engineering and for society. Our overarching goal at the Royal Academy of Engineering is to harness the power of engineering to build a sustainable society and an inclusive economy that works for everyone. And we've used these critical conversations to look at some of the engineering challenges and opportunities that will be crucial to addressing this goal. In March 2023, the government published its UK science and technology framework, which set out, and I quote, the five technologies that are most critical to the UK, quantum technologies, semiconductors, engineering biology, artificial intelligence, and telecommunications. Each of these technologies are being explored through this mini series of critical conversations. And for each event, I'll be joined by a brilliant panel of experts to help us understand what these technologies are, why they matter, and what we need to do to capture the benefits and manage the risks. Our first event, Exploring Quantum, took place at the end of July. So if you missed it, you can still catch up via the link in the chat. And you can also use that link to take you to an event summary. But today, we're going to be focusing on semiconductors. Semiconductors have been in the headlines a fair bit over recent months and years, with chip shortages affecting automotive and consumer electronic supply chains, debate over the ownership of UK semiconductor companies, including due to national security concerns, and assertive investments into the sector in both the US and the EU. So to help us make sense of all of this, I'm delighted to be joined by Professor Rachel Oliver, a fellow of our academy, an academy chair in emerging technology, professor of materials science and, and director of the Cambridge Centre for Gallium Nitride, as well as being founder of the spin-out company Poro Technologies Limited. And also by Professor John Goodacre, formerly director of technology and systems at chip giant Arm, and now professor of computer architectures at the Department of Computer Science at the University of Manchester. And John has also been appointed by UK Research and Innovation as the director of the Digital Security by Design Challenge Fund. Welcome, Rachel and John. I'm going to kick off by asking Rachel and John a few questions, but we're then going to open it up to the audience. So you can drop your questions into the comments section on this page at any point, and I'm going to try and get through as many of your questions as possible in the course of our event. But without further ado, let's get this conversation started. So... I think we have to start with the basics. Semiconductors are a group of materials used across a wide range of technologies that we rely on daily with applications in a huge range of industries from telecommunications to defense, energy, transport, sensors, and also in emerging technologies such as artificial intelligence and quantum computing. Semiconductors are often grouped by material type, for example, silicon, compound, organic, or by application. For example, integrated circuits, photonics, power electronics, communications and data storage. So, Rachel, I'm going to ask you, what else do our audience need to know to understand what semiconductors are and what they do? So I think it may be useful to think about what this sort of material is. And we're used to materials like metals, which are really good conductors. They conduct electricity under almost all circumstances. And maybe people are also used to insulators, which don't conduct electricity at all. So I don't know, something like concrete or wood or a house brick is not a good conductor of electricity as an insulator. Um, semiconductors, really, it depends on the circumstances, whether they conduct electricity, and we can get some control on whether they conduct electricity. So sometimes how we control whether they conduct is by applying a voltage. And that means that because we can apply a, a voltage and control whether the semiconductor conducts electricity or not, we can make a switch that we're controlling with that voltage. And that really is the beginning of a lot of the uses of semiconductor in logic and computing. What you need is loads and loads of tiny little switches that you can make out of this voltage controlled conductivity in semiconductors. And that allows you to start making computer chips. Brilliant. That's a very helpful start of a 10. So I'm now going to find out a bit more about what you each work on. So John, can you talk to us about which aspect of semiconductors you're active in and also why that matters to all of us? Thank you. Well, I guess I can start by uh, moving on from what uh, Rachel said in terms of I've got a switch. So my career has been mostly about how many switches can I put together to do something interesting? 
So in, in essence, if you sort of start working up the stack there, you know, if you have a, a small handful of switches, you can move up to a logic gate. So for example, you know, if two people agree, then you can do, do something that kind of logic. If you then move up to sort of six of those switches, you can remember a bit of information. And if you move up to about uh, 60 billion of them, then you can run Mac OS and uh, have a MacBook Pro happily doing whatever application you want to do. So my career has been mostly in the area of digital design. Uh, so one of the uh, things I worked on, for example, was you know how fewer transistors can we add to a, a processor, so uh, something that runs software, so that we can have a multi-core processor, lots of them working together. So that was the kind of activity I was involved in commercially and, and other technologies, how the multi-cores support virtualization in the cloud, et cetera, big lift, all those kind of things were things where we were trading basically how many transistors we need to do something because basically the transistor costs, whether it's a silicon cost or a power cost. So it's always been historically, you know, how much can you get done for how few transistors and how much power on, on those. That also meant working with the people that manufacture the chip. So a chip is what the silicon goes into. So we sort of start off with the design. We etch it down onto a piece of silicon that goes into a package. The package goes into a product. But there's a big manufacturing step uh, through there. So that obviously, uh, again, has been in the press a lot recently with a lot of the CHIPS Acts and the European CHIPS Acts talking tens of billions of pounds to support manufacturing com coming uh, uh, to sovereign regions. So that's been quite an interesting thing. My research myself was actually for the last decade mostly on how do we build computers to do exascale computation. So that's 10 to the 18 zero operations every second. So a very, very large computer, lots of transistors and a very large power budget as well. Now, as, as you mentioned in the introduction, I'm also doing the digital security by design program. And that's part of UKRI, which is sort of a, an agency of the UK government. And that has obviously then got me involved in that semiconductor security bit in terms of the strategy, which I'm sure we'll uh, move on to eventually uh, in, in today's chat. Brilliant. Thank you very much indeed, John. And Rachel, you're coming at this from quite a different angle. So would you like to tell us a bit about what you work on and again, why it should be of interest to all of us? Thank you. Yeah, so I don't really work on silicon, which is maybe the kind of foundational semiconductor that most people have heard of. I work on compound semiconductors, mostly a material called gallium nitride. Um, and many people listening may actually have a little bit of gallium nitride at home and not realize it because if you've got an energy efficient led light bulb then the the part of that light bulb is actually emitting the light rather than kind of being controlling whether the light's being emitted or making sure the device stays cool or just kind of making sure it fits in your socket that will be made from gallium nitride okay um so gallium nitride is the material behind energy efficient LEDs that are used in lighting. And that's quite sort of significant potentially to the public because these are light bulbs which use between five and 10 times less electrical energy than your kind of traditional light bulb with like a, a tungsten filament wind up in it. Um, and that could mean that we can use quite a lot less electricity in the UK. Um, traditionally, we've been using about 20% of the electricity generated for lighting, which is actually a really big chunk. Um, hopefully, people can use those sorts of light bulbs to cut down their electricity bills, which is certainly a current concern. Um, materials like gallium nitride, they also have a lot of other applications. We use them to make transistors, switches, like John and I were talking about before. But these are switches that handle large amounts of power. So if you're thinking about something like an electric vehicle, when you charge that, you need to take um, alternating current AC power from the grid, but it needs to be in a DC form to charge your car battery. You'll need power handling there. Gallium nitride can help with that. Um, lots of other kind of power conversion applications. And there again, gallium nitride is going to make that process more efficient than um, using other semiconductors. So it will handle power conversion within an electric car in ways that will mean that electric car will have a greater range, for example. So this is quite a different picture of what we do with semiconductors, hopefully saving us quite a lot of energy. Um, and I'm quite passionate about the fact these are kind of easy things to achieve. It's not like, oh, you know, 
become vegan or something it's like have a different light bulb in your house or have your car go a bit further on one charge if you get an electric car so this is stuff that we can do using semiconductor technology which kind of eases this transition to net zero a little bit thank you rachel that's a really helpful introduction as well um john which other areas of semiconductor research and innovation beyond the two that you've just given us an insight into do you think are likely to be important in the next few years so when we look beyond, uh, well, the best way to look forward is to look back, of course. So if we look at what's been happening in the silicon design for switches for computers, if you like, they've been riding a, a, a an observation called Moore's law, where it's basically something that we do twice, twice as many transistors in the same area over time. Now, unfortunately, that's that all count slowing down. And even if it's not finished, it's getting extremely expensive to do things now. What we've had is that meant has meant that the model of the computer, the, the, the way that people write software and deliver products and services has been fairly stable, if you like, over that period. So I think what's going to happen in the uh, near, near to midterm future is are, are there's going to be new models of computing. So the idea that it isn't just, you know, for any computer people, you fall into NIF statements, if you like. And I think the two that are primary candidates is obviously the neuromorphic uh, computation. So in other words, using transistors or other artifacts, other materials to rather than just look at logic gates to making decisions and storing values, but actually working like your brain. It's a brain inspired type of computing. And then the other one that obviously, and, and you covered this last time, quantum computing. So the idea that you know, we're looking at another physical artifact of the world, the quantum effects, sub subatomic rather than photons or electrons, that kind of thing. So I think you know, those are probably the, the, key, the key areas for future technologies. Uh, what's going to happen in, in the crystal ball for current technologies is also of interest. And obviously I mentioned uh, earlier, you know, computers getting bigger and faster, but clearly there's a bigger concern about how they do it as well. So that's uh, where the work on things like secure by design comes in. Let's not just run software, any software as fast as we can, but let's make sure it does something meaningful and integrity with high integrity, resilience, and, and obviously cyber safety as well. I think the, the, the final one I'll probably put in there would be around uh, the, the functions and the mechanics for building it. So let's just make sure that we can understand how the artifacts, so I mentioned the artifact for quantum being a subatomic. There's other ones, so it's photonic. So the idea of using photons and light for computation. So I think the, the actual material and the artifact of the world will be a, a, another area that uh, will come through in the post-semiconductor or the augmented semiconductor when semi just sort of does the legacy stuff. Thank you very much, John. Uh, Rachel, you are a materials person. John has given you... So uh, segue. <laughs> Anything that you'd like to add to that? Yeah, I mean, I think the new applications that people like John are envisaging are going to put a lot of strain on the existing materials, but there are new materials coming through, both for computing, but also for some of these other applications of semiconductors. So I'm excited by, for example, materials called hybrid perovskite semiconductors, which, so you at the beginning, Hayekin, talked about like, organic semiconductors and compound semiconductors are kind of separate things, whereas these are kind of both, <laughs> um, which are showing some amazing new properties, very easy to manufacture potentially as well, and might make much better solar cells. So most solar cells are silicon, but there are these new materials coming through which will improve those. So there's lots of novel material science coming up in the semiconductor world. I think the other thing is that there's been a bit of a tendency to silo these sets of materials, they all have different strengths, but in the end, you can build technologies that use all of them, um, which is something I would talk about as heterogeneous or hybrid integration. I think John might want to come in with something on that as well. Yeah, so just picking that up on that, Rachel. So, so yes, I think what we've got is a, a place where things were all silicon. Obviously, we've now got the compounds bringing their special effects. There are other things, there's things called spintronics, the photonic side, the magnetics are all sort of different ways people are looking at technology coming together. Now, in the Moore's law period, everything was integrated monolithically in, on a single device. And I think one of the big changes we'll see in the mid, again, the short to midterm is what's called heterogeneous integration of those technologies. 
So we're not forcing the photonic people to use the three nanometer TSMC process or the spintronic person to match that or being able to bring all of those things together in a single integrated device. So I think that's re really where the next big wave will come. And that is actually mentioned in the uh, National Semiconductor Strategy, one of the areas of interest and in defence for the UK as well. Great. Well, I'm going to have to upgrade my very simple ABC introduction to semiconductors based on what you've just said, but you've, you've, done, you've done a lovely job of um, setting out a little bit about um, why semiconductors matter and what they are, and some of the interesting areas of innovation um, that we're starting to see emerge. So it's not surprising at all that the government is showing interest in this. And John, you've just alluded to the National Semiconductor Strategy. Of course, the government published this after, I think it's fair to say, a reasonably long uh, wait for it in May. And um, the strategy focuses in on the UK's particular areas of so-called strategic advantage in the semiconductor sector. So things like semiconductor design, cutting edge compound semiconductors, our world leading R&D system, research and development, research and innovation system. Um, and it, it harnesses all that in, in the context of the sort of strategic advantage through science and technology agenda. So what does that mean? That means harnessing science and technology purposefully, intentionally to achieve defined outcomes in terms of security, prosperity, resilience, international influence, as well as people and the environment, ultimately with the aim of conferring comparative advantage, in this case for the UK. Um, it's, a, it's a really important milestone. And, and John, you've been involved with policy development in this area for, for quite some time. What are your thoughts on the strategy? Well, it's good to have one. And I think it's even better that it's uh, it, it looked really hard at the, the multiple sectors, because obviously, as we're just introducing here, semiconductors is everything from a light bulb and green and net zero and or transport with EVs through to computation, through to critical infrastructure delivery. And I think that what woke the government up, and you're right, it was about, I think, about three years ago was at the, the end of COVID as we were coming out of that, they went, oh, at the supply chain disruptions, the impact on industry. I think the, the Ukraine situation has also brought awareness of the supply issue. And so really what is, uh, is highlighted, I think, in the, the, the strategy today is the, obviously, as you mentioned, the growth of the the domestic sector, there are specialisms in design, the specialisms in the materials and substances there. But then you look at the, as you say, the assurance of supply, what is required to mitigate the risks, whether it's as, uh, local or international. And obviously the, the, the entirety and scale of semiconductors, even the 50 billion being put in America isn't going to be enough to bring the entire semiconductor to a single, single country. So I think the approach that the UK is taking around its specialisms and the building of those up is key. And then the ones that call out again, they sort of feel like the third pillar in terms of protecting the national security. And there's, there's, there's two aspects to that. One is, as you mentioned in the introduction, the, the exports and the, you know, the acquisition kind of things, but also the, the, the area that I work in, which is the digital security by design, the idea that semiconductors are actually at the centre of everything that we do in society, business, you know, your phone, your light switch, everything, then the last thing we want is those to not be secure. Because at that point, you've got a big problem. So obviously bringing security into the semiconductor strategy, I think was a very astute observation as well. Great, John, I think we might come back to that in a minute. But I do want to turn to you, Rachel, because alongside the strategy, of course, the government did announce some funding commitments. Uh, so the UK has committed a billion pounds over 10 years for semiconductors with £200 million committed over the 2023-25 to 25 period. And the government's exploring the feasibility of how we can develop infrastructure to better support commercial R&D in the UK, as well as a strategic coordination function for the UK semiconductor sector as a whole. Um, John alluded to, to the scale of investment in the US, so there's obviously been some comparison made between the US CHIPS Act, which I think allocates around $50 billion US dollars, and the EU is aiming to mobilise, I think it's more than 43 billion euros in public and private investments. So if you were in charge of the UK's budget, what would you do with it? And what's your reflection on whether we're in a good place to achieve the strategic advantage that the semiconductor aims for with funding at the current scale? So I think John alluded to, and also you did happen, that really we need to focus on the areas of the UK strength. So there's strength in compound semiconductor, there's strength in design. There is, I think, across the board, real recognition that the universe that the UK is a really 
innovative place yeah that there's new innovation coming up and what we need to do is figure out how the uk gets maximum societal and economic benefit from that so i guess then we have to think well what what do these what do we need to take these innovations from the lab to a commercial product which really is making benefit for the uk and generally that takes money yeah it takes access to the right tools and sometimes that's physical tools which you actually make things with sometimes that's software tools that allow you to do design in a way that allows things to then be made so money and tools and then the third thing is people so we do need to think about like how the strategy can provide those needs to the uk academic sector and to uk industry perhaps particularly to small companies startups that kind of thing um in the us they are developing something with one of the many strands of their large amount of money called the National Semiconductor Technology Center. Um, and as you know, there's a um, infrastructure initiative feasibility study going on at the moment in the UK, which potentially may start something similar for the UK. And I think um, I would draw inspiration from this National Semiconductor Technology Center in the US. It's going to have um, a convening function. It's going to have the power to bring together government, industry, customers, people in the supply chain, universities, investors, all to really continue to maintain a strategic plan for the sector. And the UK hasn't had strategic planning for the semiconductor sector for some time up until this new strategy has been developed. There's been a kind of vacuum in strategy. So making sure that there is the, the wherewithal in place to maintain that strategic plan, I think, is really important to start with. And then we need to think about the money, people and tools. OK, so a national semiconductor centre of some description could provide access to tools. It could have some actual physical fabrication cap capability, but it could also kind of lead UK access to negotiations around licences for design tools, for example. It could think about workforce development, what we need to do to get more people trained here in the UK to have the right sk skills, but also whether um, policy is in the right place to bring in talented people from abroad. Um, and it could also start to pull together a relevant investment fund. So there's something um, kind of in the pipeline policy wise called the LIFT initiative, L-I-F-T-S, long term investment for technology and science. That's still in its infancy. But that kind of patient capital is really what you need to do this kind of laboratory to real world innovation that actually takes brilliant ideas and gets them to products that people use and that um, lead to, you know, more money, more jobs, et cetera, in the UK. Um, all of that's quite a big ask. And do I think we can definitely achieve advantage within the current budget? I'm really glad there is a budget, but probably it's going to need more investment long term. Some of that may be private investment, but kind of coordinated from something like this LIFT initiative. Hopefully, by using the current budget well, we can also leverage more funds from both government and the private sector. I think we have to see this as a starting point. Thank you, Rachel. That's that's a really helpful insight. I think, you know, some of us who are not so close to it struggle to know quite what to make of it. And that's that's been a, a, a very helpful insight. Um, I can see questions coming in from the audience. I'd like to get through as many of them as possible. I've just got a couple more I'd like to get through with you and John first. So, John, I do want to come back to this issue that, that you uh, mentioned in passing. You know, we're in this period where semiconductors are inextricably linked with geopolitics, we know that almost every aspect of innovation does rely on international collaboration. We know that supply chains are international. How can we get the balance right between managing security risks and competition whilst recognising that collaboration and access to, to talent and innovation and manufacturing worldwide is, is a very important part of the UK strategy. Yeah, I think the, the, the biggest change that we've had in the last few years is, is the awareness of that complexity, because obviously the, the industry itself has been operating within that complexity quite happily for, for, for decades. So it, it knows if it wants to package a chip, it sends it over to the OSET people in Malaysia or somewhere. Yeah, so the, the, the way that it works it, is no, but what that doesn't give people is a knowledge to supply risk uh, shocks. So the idea that something uh, goes wrong. Now, there's been a couple of things recently, obviously, the, the COVID one was uh, quite a, a big shock to the industry in the sense that, you know, I can see one of the questions here is talking about the shortage. 
what was it a material thing? No, it was just a supply and demand issue that people said, oh, people aren't going to be buying cars if they're not going anywhere. Stop all the orders. Those orders are then taken up by people at home wanting new televisions. And the industry already runs pretty close to full utilisation. So what you've really got there is a, a mix between the needing to understand what your supply chain is, what are your critical weakness points, can you second source, who are the countries that you are aligned with to collaborate with, and obviously those are the things that uh, have already sort of been discussed at government levels now, which is which are the countries in which you'll have that infrastructures that fill gaps that can't be brought national, whereas some national things like uh, incubators for startups inside design is something that clearly can be done uh, nationally access to a two nanometer fabrication plant isn't so it's that kind of discussions and adjustments on the awareness that we've now got got the strategy that's then going to obviously open up and unlock the treasury funds hopefully beyond this so, you know one of the things you can say about the billion to find that uh, what's called mid uh, spending review was was pretty good yeah, so that was not planned. So hopefully we can plan for more things in the future as well. But anyway, yeah, so geopolitical, political sharing, understanding it is probably the key thing. And as, as Rachel says, you know, getting institutes and things that can actually own that coordination and knowledge of supply chain risks and shocks would be great. Thank you, John. And whilst we're on the topic of um, the supply chain challenges that people became aware of during covid um, and have really taken a long time to to, to start to improve in, in some sectors. Um, you referenced the, the question from Melissa Deline around the underlying factors for that. But there are some issues that relate to the availability of critical minerals as well, aren't there? So um, is there anything that you or Rachel would like to add on that, aside from the sort of um, you know, just-in-time business models and supply and demand mismatch that we saw during the pandemic? Yeah. Are there any other issues that you, you think we should be considering when we can, when we look at the, the long term potential um, constraints and bottlenecks uh, on, on uh, the UK's access to um, semiconductor materials and inputs? Well, the one I've caught, I heard you just in time. I think just in case is the uh, new paradigm now. <laughs> so just in case, I know, because there was, there was a great example when they realised that 80% of the semiconductors manufacturing material, neon, came from the Ukraine. Now, thankfully, that was a just in case, and they had a few tankers, but that that was quite a big risk or concern at the time. But yeah, <laughs> Rachel. Yeah, and equally, um, so gallium is becoming a concern because China has recently instituted some fairly protectionist policies around gallium coming from um, China, and there there are other sources. There are. Um, I've lost the word. There is gallium in the earth in places like Australia. Um, but we do have to you know, be very aware that these these materials, these elements are critical to some of these supply chains. You can't just kind of substitute them out for something else. If you take the gallium out of gallium nitride and put a different material in, you have a completely different set of materials properties. So we do have to kind of make sure we, we are cognizant of these things. Um, for some things, we also need to think a little bit harder about how we recycle components and get critical minerals back, because in the long term, these are finite resources. Thank you, Rachel. Yes, I mean, there's almost a whole uh, event in its own right on that topic. But let's let's just pick up one of the other topics I wanted to make sure we covered. And I'm going to ask you a general question, but there's, there's also a specific audience question, which we'll add in. And that's looking at the skills base. So the strategy that we've been talking about does cover skills and workforce to some extent, and there's further work being done on this. Can you tell us a bit about what do skills and workforce um, challenges and, and actions taken to address those challenges look like at the moment? And then there's a very specific question from Priyanka Sharuda, who's Sharuda Days, sorry if I've pronounced that incorrectly, who's asked, if you if you're a student, what skills would you need to have to enter the semiconductor industry? So Rachel, if I can ask you to start off on that, and by all means, John, if you'd like to add, um, please do. So if I'm honest, skills is one of the areas I was a bit disappointed in the strategy. I mean, there's some lovely things in it. So there's, for example, it's highlighting um, a program for teachers called the Leveling Up Premium, which is an extra payment for new teachers who are going to go and teach maths and physics in disadvantaged schools. And that's clearly a good thing. Great. However, it's a pre-existing scheme 
which runs until 2025. So this is not a long-term investment in the future of the semiconductor industry. It's just something that's kind of been gathered in from industry existing policy. Um, I think there are skills shortages in the semiconductor sector, and we need to think of that kind of in the round because there are skill shortages across engineering, and we can't kind of decouple the two. Firstly, because skills development for semiconductors is not kind of a totally separate thing. There are big crossovers with other sectors, photonics, quantum tech, comms, a lot of the same skills go across the whole piece. So we need to think broadly about developing the skills base here. Also, there's no point robbing Peter to pay Paul. There's no point kind of taking technically minded individuals out of other sectors and bringing them into semiconductors and leaving skill shortages elsewhere. Um, if we look at Taiwan, which is perhaps the economy where the semiconductor sector is strongest globally, when they started to kind of drive forward strategically their um, semiconductor sector, they also implemented major cross-curricular educational activities. This is back in the 1970s and 1980s. And that's the scale of thinking we really need to think of here. So people like um, Professor Bashir al Shimi, who's at King's College, they are talking about plans for engineering education that go all the way from primary level up and that's sort of the scale of um skills development i think we need to start thinking about and it's not just a semiconductor sector question it's an engineering question i'm sure you are more aware of that than i am i think the other thing i'd like to say kind of before addressing specific skills is we need to think really realistically about the challenges of bringing in talent from overseas. This is a very, very international sector and Brexit has made it difficult to recruit people at, from Europe, to be brutally honest about it. Um, and the current immigration environment is also not necessarily helping us to bring in talented um, people from the wider globe. So there are previous policies which are mentioned in the semiconductor strategy around things like the high potential individual visa but still from my perspective trying to recruit people into particularly my academic group it's very very difficult at the moment to bring things in from overseas and I'd love to see more from government in terms of backing the sector to provide the right visa schemes the right immigration schemes to bring in talent um so, Rachel, before we go on to the question um, from the audience, actually, I think whilst we're talking about this, this round sort of rounded picture of skills, it's worth also just checking in on diversity, because obviously we have a massive challenge in terms of diversity deficit across engineering as a whole, which impacts on you know the, the, the size of the available talent pool, but also the extent to which we can have the best talent um, working on these critical areas. Um, what does the semiconductor skills space look like? Is it pretty similar to the rest of engineering where about 16.5% of professional engineers in the UK are women? So I would say, so I work across sectors. I work in semiconductor, but I also work in other sectors. And I would say that semiconductor is more male dominated than other sectors I work in. I'm not sure there's good data to back that up, but it's not that unusual for me to be the only woman in a meeting that might have 50 people in it certainly and i think this is true across the engineering piece at senior levels this is a very male very white sector in terms of its leadership um and i think you know we're missing out on talent if we are only really looking at half the population um and it, it those sorts of issues are in the detail i have more than once in my career worked with equipment that I'm simply not tall enough to operate um, and I'm not a short woman I'm five foot seven um, but the default operator for a lot of European manufactured semiconductor equipment is a tall man and if you're a little bit shorter it becomes very very difficult to do the job so these sorts of details need attention but as you know there's also sector-wide issues um, in the engineering sector I'm very concerned about chartership and whether that process acts as a more difficult gateway to come through to some demographics than to others. And I'd really like to see the professional engineering institutes facing up more proactively to some of these questions. Brilliant, Rachel. Thank you. You've given us such a, a broad set of answers. I might turn to John, actually, and say, is there anything you'd like to add to what Rachel's covered? And then we've got the a question from Priyanka around what, what skills should students think about developing in order to enter the semiconductor industry? Yeah, I, I think... Obviously, I agree with everything Rachel said there. I think the, the key thing for when you say the semiconductor industry is just realising how broad it is. 
So yes, we've got material scientists that often come from physics. We've got, like I was saying earlier, new material science. So we might be actually having biologists in the semiconductor industry, obviously mathematicians, straight engineering. But then the industry also has the manufacturing side as well. So we've got process control engineers that maybe don't need PhDs that are more just general, do I know how to use machines and want to work on machinery through to design people that could be, you know, things. So, so really there's a, there's a whole suite of different types of entry point into the, into the, into the semiconductor sector itself. And it'll be a preference to choose which area, whether you design sat at a computer, you just to glorify software engineer kind of thing through to actually designing materials that do fancy things like, flashlights or you know catch photons flying down wires it's it's a very very different very broad sector in that regard thanks john and uh, rachel anything to add to that specific uh, question i mean i guess the one thing that i would add is that something perhaps we lack and that um if, if i were a student who were trying to build my career i would therefore perhaps try and forge myself into a person who would fill this lag is that people is people who have at least some understanding across the breadth that John is thinking of. So I see situations where the engineers, the physicists and the material scientists are essentially all talking different languages and talking across purposes and making the links between the separate disciplines, I think is really valuable. And I'd love to see more people trained with their specialisms, but with also this broad ability to, to address the kind of the breadth of the sector. Fantastic. Okay. So, so very, sorry, John, go for it. I was going to say that's very apparent, not just in the hardware software, world but you know ask an ex, somebody who designs an ai model what a memory cache is and they've no idea so we, we, there's a large gap of broad knowledge as well as the specialisms that obviously uh, we, we do trade quite well on in the uk <laughs> thank you both for your um very helpful thoughts on that question i'm going to go to some more audience questions and just to say thank you to those who are submitting questions please keep them coming um we've got a question from roger woods and the question is Given that the £1 billion investment is modest, what would you highlight as key investments? Single or distributed centres of excellence, new models of university academia engagement? I might go to you first, John, as Rachel talked a little bit about this in, in her previous answer, and then I'll come back to you, Rachel. Yeah, hi, Roger. So very hard to say, because again, it's a very broad sector. So, so for some things, yes, a distributed model works well for others where you're having to characterize something that's just being built you probably want the manufacturer next to the characterizer so you want centralized i think the second half of the question where is talking about the university academic engagement i think that is where the uh, benefits and specialisms of the uk can make a bigger impact by actually trying to connect or create a intellectual conduit if you like from from the research excellence into industrial outcomes so, yes, I would definitely support new models of intervention around that area. But then in terms of the science bits, distributed or centralised case by case basis. Thank you, John. And, and Rachel, you talked about the US model of I think it's the National Semiconductor Technology Centre. Um, what, what more would you add to what you've already said in relation to Roger's question? So I guess one aspect that might speak to Roger's question is that there's been discussion during the building of the strategy and since about whether the UK ought to be kind of picking winners amongst the future technologies or going for a more kind of spread betting approach. Um, and I think personally, I'd like to see whether it's a single or distributed centre, something that has flexibility and agility to kind of move between for different foci because i think picking winners of the of the coming new technologies particularly with new materials at this stage is quite risky because things do just suddenly appear i don't think um any of us were quite prepared for how um how big a deal graphene was going to be and equally i mentioned the hybrid profs guys earlier and they they did sort of burst onto the scene and we don't we, we want the agility to engage with really exciting new materials developments particularly when they come in the uk so I think however we invest, we want to do it in a way that lets us pivot when we need to. OK, thank you. And let's move to Mike Jennings' question. Um, I appreciate the two nanometer node fab is too expensive an investment for the UK government. I think, John, you mentioned that. Um, do you think we should have a large silicon fab so that we can prove out designs locally? And uh, this could also apply to compounds. So, uh, John, do you want to start with that? And I'll pass to Rachel afterwards. Yeah, so... Uh... Uh, you know, should we have our local fabrication capability? I think for system on chip 
piloting and prototyping, I, I would say yes, uh, because clearly if, if you're running a commercial fab, then the, what you want is to be volumes, just keep the utilisation of your fab really high and busy. That might not be right for trying out a new top level of photonics or something. So to be able to, you know, another one, you know, if you, you want to go and drop your silicon part of your quantum computer together, cryogenics, where do you go and build that? You're not going to do, ask TSMC to do something special for you. So, yes, I think the UK should be invest in that. Now, the node of investment becomes an interesting one. I don't think, personally, I don't think it's a node question. I think it's actually a technology question. And if we go a little geeky for a while, if it's a 193 nanometer immersion uh, laser technology, it basically takes you from 90 to 20. So that kind of range of machine would allow fairly low cost comparatively to, to be able to support quite a broad set of different specialisms. It's those specialisms that I then describe, which would then be usable in the heterogeneous integration. So you wouldn't necessarily have to jump down to two nanometers to then you know, be commercially viable because you could then you know, bring in an, an international small geometry next to your new widget, a clever bit of technology through the integration. But at least you've got the piloting and prototyping of system capability with the rapid cost and low cost aspects uh, nationally. Thanks, John. And Rachel, what's your perspective? I very much agree with John. It's about the prototyping lines. I think the the other advantage of having onshore ability to do prototyping to prove designs is that it will be really, really helpful to the innovators, the small businesses, the SMEs, because one of the things that's always of concern if you're sending things out to international fabs is whether in the process you leak not necessarily kind of tied down IP, but know-how, the sort of small stuff that kind of makes is going to make your idea work, um, but, but maybe you're trying to keep under your hat. So trying to kind of maintain the security of UK IP, I think would be easier if we did have more capability in the UK to do that kind of prototyping. Great. That's a clear steer from both of you. Um, I'm going to come back to audience questions in just a minute, but there's another question I wanted to just have the chance to probe with you, um, which is around the potential for this technology to improve environmental sustainability. So, Rachel, you tilted at this earlier on when you talked about LED lighting and um, EV charging, electric vehicle charging. Maybe, John, could you set up a slightly kind of zoomed out picture of what the opportunities are to support the delivery of the UN Sustainable Development Goals, if you want to frame it really broadly? Um, I think it should be helpful to kind of build that picture up a bit. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. So what does sustainability mean to the semiconductor industry? I think it means uh, two things primarily. One is, as Rachel mentioned earlier, what can we do with what's being built already and recycled? So there's that part of sustainability and availability of finite resources. But the other is, you know, the use of the technology in reducing the consumption of something else. So the, the idea that, you know, digitization, digital transformations of business manufacturing, all of that kind of thing can actually make other things more sustainable, light bulbs, the transport, the EV cars, all of those things that are going on the digital or you know, using semiconductors to make a lower impact of, of non-sustainable aspects. Now, you know, there's a counter argument, unfortunately, which is you, you can do more. Well, I'll do more than and you consume as much as I can still. But, you know, we'll, we'll see how that uh, levels out. But yeah, th th I think it's those two aspects in the semiconductor sustainability anyway. Thanks, John. And, and Rachel, would you like to add anything? I mean, you also touched on the importance of recycling and sort of circular economy mindsets, which is the other side of this um, sustainability equation. Uh, anything you'd like to add? Yeah, I mean, I think I'd also kind of draw out one of the things that John was touching on there that so, you know, I'm a big gallium nitride fan. I like my energy efficient LED light bulbs, but I'm also aware that um, there have been studies done, particularly in Europe, showing that when they have brought in um, really significant usage of LED light bulbs, it hasn't actually cut electricity very much at all. It's just meant people have their lights on more. Um, and then. But in a global sense. Yeah, get a faster computer. You know, you use it. Yeah. yeah, in a global sense, though, it becomes quite a difficult question because I would actually argue that there are parts of the world that could probably do with their lights on a bit more. Um, you know, so uh, Professor Amano, who's one of the Nobel Prize winners for gall gallium nitride technology, talks about 
um, installations in Mongolian yurts, which use LED lighting and local solar. And that allows them to do education in the evenings when people are working during the day. And that's actually improving people's lives. So it becomes quite a kind of push and pull, like, right? oh, well, should we um, use these technologies to be more efficient? Or are there places where we may want to actually have more light and more use of technology because it really will um, cause other improvements which would come under the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Absolutely. It's um, whenever we talk about technologies and environmental impact, we have to think of technologies as part of socio-technical systems. And it's the humans that often determine ultimately what the uh, environmental impact is. So we've got quite a few questions building up. Let me try and um, get through a few more of them. Uh, Mark Stocker has asked, as the UK government seems to be putting an emphasis on developing an electric vehicle battery capability, are there semiconductor opportunities that could benefit from this funding? Uh, would either of you like to have a go at that one? I guess Rachel? probably I'm closest. So the the batteries, I think, are not really a semiconductor issue, but how we charge the batteries and do that more efficiently is a semiconductor question. So that's very much what wide bank of materials, gallium nitride, also silicon carbide, gallium oxide, potentially even diamond as a semiconductor, are going to provide electronics which allows us to do that charging more efficiently. And I think um, making sure that we use our, our charges efficiently will also probably extend the lifetime of batteries. It will reduce the, the stress on the battery sector, which I think is going to become a, a big deal as we um, have more and more people moving to EVs. Thank you, Rachel. And I'm going to move on to Anthony O'Neill's question. Um, and we've talked about the CHIPS Act in the US and the EU equivalent. Uh, and he says it's a response to 80% of silicon microchips being made in Taiwan and Korea, both of which are vulnerable due to geopolitical tensions. Do you feel the UK strategy is also responding to this? And I think that's one for you, John. Well, I, I think, you know, the 80, 90% of uh, very small chips is definitely in, in Taiwan. I think the... Uh, generation of the immersion the, the, the level i was talking about is also in europe and america and japan still got quite a lot there as well so actually the the mass market of semiconductor is actually quite a global supply that doesn't obviously reduce the 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 threat and the potential shocks as he, as he mentions in that region which is why the europe and the us are not responding with local manufacturing but that's but so are you know the UK can't respond at that level. So it's re really making the relationships work to maintain the assurance of supply where necessary. But if you think about it, you know, in the UK, yes, we buy some small chips, but we haven't got many manufacturers of the small chip use here. So we, you know, we don't have the iPhone manufacturer or the, you know, the, the, the supercomputer manufacturer. So actually we buy the end products, but we don't actually build them here. So, you know, that wouldn't really make sense to have that locally. And I think the realisation of the strategy of you know, what is actually needed in the UK while managing those international relationships is, is the key finding there. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm going to add another question from the audience. Helen Yules has asked about the UK's private sector strengths and weaknesses when it comes to the UK semiconductor industry success. She's asking, is it a big corporates, scaling companies, or both? And again, John, I'll give you that to start with. So, so as Rachel mentioned, the, we, we've got some clustering around the UK on uh, semiconductor technology and the photonic side and things like that. So the South Wales is often, often described as the, the compound cluster and things like that. And a lot of that is, you know, fairly large companies comparatively to the UK average size. Uh, so, you know, it's helping them to sustain their relevance in the markets. It's also very much the small innovative company coming out of some innovation in some university as well. So it, it really is about both in that regard. It's, it's you know, how do we get the, the value of the academic strength of the UK with the ability to deliver and maintain and support and protect that in a way that, you know, it brings growth to the, the, to the country. So it's all really around, you know, supporting the growth of our economy and the society in which we live. I think those are the sort of key things there for me. And Rachel, you're you're at the spin-out end of the spectrum. You've got a successful spin-out. What would be your reflections on both how um, conducive the environment is in the UK for that sort of innovative startup trying to scale up 
Um, and more generally in relation to Helen's question, the UK strengths and weaknesses across the private sector. So I think we were really lucky spinning out a company because we have really excellent support from our university tech transfer office. And I think that's something that's developing broadly across the UK is a real awareness in universities of the the value of the innovation that's happening in their labs and in their departments. Um, I think that I alluded earlier to this concept of patient capital. And I think that's genuinely somewhere where for the small businesses, the UK falls down. There's been a a tendency and things may be moving on as you know government strategy and other things move on but a tendency to sort of invest in the sort of software companies or the apps the things that look like they're going to turn around quickly have a quick exit basically make a quick book um and semiconductor companies particularly where the innovation involves new materials or, or developing new hardware it's not going to happen overnight it needs patient capital and i think that's something that is really really important to maintaining that kind of base of small enterprises in terms of kind of large industry there are some big companies what we don't have are like the giants you know the sort of giants of the computing industry or the giants of the the kind of consumer electronic products the people who make the um TVs or, um, I don't know, there's plenty of semiconductors even in your washing machine. There's not much of that in the UK. And we could perhaps, um, sometimes that makes life for small industries difficult because it's difficult to stay onshore in the UK if the people who are going to be working with you, investing in your product are potentially overseas. Thanks, Rachel. And I'm going to stick with you for the last audience question because the clock is ticking. Um, Just a heads up, I'm going to give both you and John the opportunity after that to just leave the audience with a final thought, something maybe you haven't had the chance to, to cover yet or something you want to reinforce. Um, so the, the last question I have here is from Melissa Deline, and it's going back to this issue of the kind of intersection between geopolitics and um, supply issues. So she says that China has a significant influence on the production of three crucial materials used in semiconductor manufacturing, silicon, germanium and gallium. Rachel, you've talked about the importance of gallium. How can we effectively tackle the challenge of addressing potential mineral shortages to prevent conflicts of interest in the semiconductor industry. It may just be conflicts, let alone conflicts of interest. Um, Rachel, I love your thoughts on that. And then I'll come to you, John, for your final thoughts before we wrap things up. So, I mean, that's an enormous question, I'm afraid. And I don't know that I necessarily have a particularly good answer. I think um, what John was talking about, about kind of being aware of the possibility of shock. So it's not just in time, it's just in case. We always, we need to have a much better kind of approach to long-term planning. We can't just assume these things are going to be available to us when we order them and turn up turn up at any moment. That across the industry um, is something we need to address. It's also something that has to be thought about at the global scale so it's no good me saying from my office in Cambridge oh well there's quite a lot of gallium in the ground in in Australia um there needs to be a sort of global thinking and we need um the the government and the big industry to really be negotiating and pushing for the long-term planning which is going to open up other sources um because I mean China having huge influence may be fine and it might not and we just you know we can't necessarily look in a crystal ball and see what's going to happen thank you rachel it is a a big issue as you say but that's um that's a useful set of comments so john if you wanted to add anything else on that (laughs) rather expansive topic we've just been trying to cover please feel free to otherwise we'd love to hear your your final thoughts for the audience yeah i think my final thoughts for the audience would be try to get excited about the opportunity that's now arising in semiconductors. So obviously, you know, we've had decades of more of the same, yeah, faster and better, et cetera. But the, we are thinking at an inflection point where specialisms are coming along, the investment, the knowledge, the awareness of the sector, the opportunities that could come. And if you're you know, a youngster looking at your career, do look at the engineering uh, directions. It doesn't necessarily have to have the word semiconductor in it. It's probably going to change by the time you get there anyway. But to definitely look at the opportunity of something like semi that's basically in every part of everything in life, you know. So it's a big time. And, you know, I always look at my phone and think, yeah, I, I, I had a part in playing the build, designing the process that enabled that type of phone. So, you know, you never know where it will go. 
Thank you for that very optimistic note to end on. And Rachel, what would be your final reflections to share with the audience? Yeah, I think probably similar to John, I would, having engaged at various levels with the semiconductor strategy, I was very surprised to have um, people telling me the semiconductor industry wasn't sexy and, and wasn't attractive to young people. And I was like, but like, I'm really sure that young people are quite interested in things like phones and like um, gaming consoles and augmented reality headsets. And this is all enabled by semiconductors. And I really think um, that the industry as a whole needs to kind of get out there and make people understand just how foundational these technologies are. And therefore, you know, how much of a difference you can make in terms of things like energy usage cost to the technologies we are all using day to day if you get involved with this industry. Well, fantastic. I would like to thank you both for having answered such an array of questions uh, with such wisdom and generosity. And um, I certainly learned a huge amount in the course of this last hour. And I certainly leave feeling very enthused about the excitement and opportunities that do exist around semiconductors. I think it's been an interesting period for semiconductors where they've sort of risen to a higher level of visibility than certainly in my lifetime I remember them having. And um, that's really important because they are everywhere in our world. They are a crucial component of our critical national infrastructure that we rely on in almost every way for, the, for, for modern life. And it's, it's really healthy that we're talking more about them. Uh, the awareness that you've both talked about uh, in terms of the, the kind of the, the more um, the more policy focused discussions of the existence of a national strategy, that um, greater acknowledgement and articulation of UK strengths, and therefore what a realistic strategy is for making the most of those strengths. Those are all positive developments. And whilst there's still a huge amount to do, um, not least to navigate some of those quite complex geopolitical issues and the fact that, that we can only uh, have a successful semiconductor strategy by understanding that we are part of a global community and will rely on global partnerships forever um, in order to make our semiconductor industry viable and to meet our national needs. All of that process of greater awareness, greater strategic thinking, I think is incredibly healthy. And um, we probably have learned quite a bit about resilience over this period as well, prompted by the uh, um, you know, the, the, the reality of living through a, a global pandemic, apart from anything else, um, that I think is really healthy. That move from just in time to just in case is something that I will certainly be um, be reciting in, in future discussions on this. And along the way, we bumped into topics I never thought we'd cover in relation to semiconductors, including spread betting and veganism. So thank you for, for giving us such a, a diverse and stimulating um, discussion today. And thank you, everyone who joined us uh, online. Uh, you gave us some great questions and those make for an a, um, even more interesting discussion. So thank you so much for your participation. If this conversation has sparked your interest, if you have further comments about today's event, you're going to get a link to a survey posted in the chat and we would love you to share your thoughts so that that feedback can help us shape and improve future events. And please do stay tuned for future critical conversations on our LinkedIn page. The next session is going to explore engineering biology. So we'll be live again on LinkedIn at 6 p.m. Uh, UK time on Tuesday, the 26th of September. And again, there'll be a, a link to register in the chat below and you can catch up on previous critical conversations via that link in the chat below as well. So thank you again for joining us and I wish you all a very good evening.